Continue reading Krishna book by Sri Bhaktivedan Swami Sula Prabhupada, Chapter 51 The Deliverance of Muchukunda. When Krishna came out of the city, Kaliyavana, who had never seen Krishna before, saw him to be extraordinarily beautiful. Dressed in yellow garments, passing through Kaliyavana's assembly of soldiers, Krishna appeared like the moon in the sky passing through the assembled clouds. Kaliyavana was fortunate enough to see the lines of Srivatsa, a particular impression on the chest of Sri Krishna and the Kostuba jewel. He was wearing Kaliyavana saw him, however, in his Vishnu form with a well-built body, four hands and eyes like the petals of a newly blooming lotus. Krishna appeared blissful with a handsome forehead and beautifully smiling face, restless eyebrows and moving earrings. Before seeing Krishna, Kaliyavana had heard about him from Narada, and now the descriptions of Narada were confirmed. Kaliyavana noticed Krishna's specific marks and the jewels on his chest. This, his beautiful garland of lotus flowers, his lotus-like eyes and similar beautiful worldly features, he concluded that this beautiful personality must be Vasudev. For every description he had previously heard from the Narad was substantiated by the presence of Krishna. Kaliyavana was astonished to see Krishna passing through his army without any weapon in his hands and without any chariot. He was simply walking on foot. Kaliyavana had come to fight with Krishna and yet he had sufficient principles not to take up any kind of a weapon. He decided to fight with him hand to hand. Thus he prepared to capture Krishna and fight. Krishna, however, went ahead without looking at Kaliyavana. Kaliyavana followed him with a desire to capture him, but in spite of his swift running, he could not capture Krishna. Krishna cannot be captured even by great yogis trembling at the speed of the mind. He can be captured only by those who follow the path of devotional service, and Kaliyavana was not practiced in devotional service. He wanted to capture Krishna, and since he could not do so, he followed him from behind. Kaliyavana began running very fast, thinking, Now I am a, I am a mass nearer, I will capture him. But he could not. Krishna led him far away and entered the cave of a hill. Kaliyavana thought that Krishna was trying to avoid fighting him and was therefore taking shelter of the cave. He rebuked him with the following words, O Krishna, I heard that you are a great hero born in the dynasty of Yadu, but I see that you are running away from fighting like a coward. It is not worthy of your good name and family tradition. Kaliyavana was following, running very fast. But still he could not catch Krishna because he was not freed from all contaminations of sinful life. According to Vedic culture, anyone who does not follow the regulative principles observed by the higher castes, the Brahmanas, Chatriyas and Vaishyas, or even those observed by the laborer class, the Sudras, is called a Mlecha or Yavana. The Vedic social situation is so planned that persons accepted as Sudras can gradually be elevated to the position of Brahmanas by the cultural advancement known as Samskara or the purificatory process. The Vedic of the Vedic scriptures is that no one becomes a Brahmana or a Malacha simply by birth. By birth everyone is accepted as a Sudra. One has to elevate himself by the purificatory process to the stage of Brahmanical life. If he doesn't, he is degrades himself further. He is then called a Malacha or Yavana. Kali Yavana belonged to the class of Malachas and Yavanas, contaminated by sinful activities. He could not approach Krishna, the principles from which higher class men are restricted, namely illicit sex, sexual indulgence, meditating, gambling and intoxication are an integral part of the lives of the Malachas and Yavanas. Being bound by such sinful activities, one cannot make any advancement in God-realization. The Bhagavad Gita confirms that only one who is completely freed from all sinful reactions can engage in devotional service of Krishna consciousness. When Krishna entered the cave of the hill, Kaliyavana followed. 
Chastising him with various harsh words, Krishna suddenly disappeared from the demon's aside, but Kalevana followed and also entered the cave. The first thing he saw was a man lying down asleep within the cave. Kalevana was eager to fight with Krishna and when he could not see Krishna, but instead saw only a man lying down. He thought that Krishna was sleeping within this cave. Kalevana was very much puffed up and proud of his strength and he thought Krishna was avoiding the fight. Therefore, he strongly kicked the sleeping man, thinking him to be Krishna. The sleeping man had been lying down for a long time. When awakened by the kicking of Kalevana, he immediately opened his eyes and began to look around in all directions. At last he saw Kalevana standing nearby. The man had been untimely awakened and was therefore very angry. And when he looked upon Kalevana in his angry mood. Rays of fire emanated from his eyes and Kalevana burned to ashes within a moment. When Maharaj Parikshit heard this incident of Kalevana's being burned to ashes, he inquired about the sleeping man from Sukadeva Goswami. Who was he? Why was he sleeping there? How had he achieved so much power that instantly by his glance Kalevana was burnt to ashes? How did he happen to be lying down in the cave of the hill? He put many questions before Sukadeva Goswami and Sukadeva answered as follows. My dear king, this person was born in the very great family of King Iksvaku in which Lord Ramchandra was also born and he happened to be the son of a great king known as Mandata. He himself was also a great soul and was known popularly as Muchukunda. King Muchukunda was a strict follower of the Vedic principles of Brahminical culture and he was truthful to his promise. He was so powerful that even demigods like Indra used to ask him to help in fighting the demons and, and as such he often fought against the demons to protect the demigods. The commander-in-chief of the demigods known as Kartikeya was satisfied with the fighting of King Mitsukunda, but once he asked that the king, having taken too much trouble in fighting the demons, retire from fighting and take a rest. Kartikeya addressed King Mitsukunda, My dear king, you have sacrificed everything for the sake of the demigods. You had a very nice kingdom, undisturbed by any kind of enemy, but you left that kingdom, neglected your opulence and possessions, and never cared for fulfillment of your personal ambitions. Due to your long absence from your kingdom while fighting the demons on behalf of the demigods, your queen, your children, your relatives, and your ministers, your ministers have all passed away in due course of time. Time and tide wait for no man. Now even if you return to your home, you will find no living, no one living there. The influence of time is very strong. Time is so powerful because it is a representation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Time is therefore stronger than the strongest. The influence of time can effect changes in subtle things without difficulty. No one can check the progress of time. As an animal tamer tames animals according to his will, time also adjusts things according to its own will. No one can supersede the arrangements made by the supreme time. Thus addressing Michikunda, the demigod requested him to ask any benediction he might be pleased with. Hmm. Any benediction and liberation cannot be awarded by any living entity but the Supreme Personality of Godhead Vishnu. Therefore, another name of Lord Vishnu or Krishna is Muchukunda, he who can award liberation. King Muchukunda had not slept for many, many years. He was engaged in the duty of fighting and therefore he was very tired. So when the demigod offered a benediction, Muchukunda simply thought of sleeping. He replied as follows, My dear Kartikya, the best of the demigods, I want to sleep now and I want from you the following benediction. Grant me the power to burn to ashes by my mere glance, anyone who disturbs my sleep and awakens me untimely. Please give me this benediction. The demigod agreed and also gave him the benediction that he would be able to take complete rest. 
Then in then King Machukunda entered the cave of the mountain. On the strength of the benediction of Kartekya, Machukunda burned Kalyavana to ashes simply by glancing at him. When the incident was over, Krishna came before King Muchukunda. Krishna had actually entered the cave to deliver King Muchukunda because of his austerity, but Krishna did not appear before him. First he arranged that first Kalevana should come before him. That is the way of the activities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He does one thing in such a way that many other purposes are served. He wanted to deliver King Muchukunda who was sleeping in the cave and at that same time he wanted to kill Kalyavana who had attacked Mathura city. By this action he served all purposes. When Lord Krishna appeared before Muchukunda, the king saw him dressed in a yellow garment, his chest marked with the symbol of Srivatsa and the Kostuba jewel hanging around his neck. Krishna appeared before him with four hands as Vishnu Murti, with a garland called Bhajanti hanging from his neck down to his knees. He looked lustrous. His face was beautifully smiling and he wore nice jewel earrings on his ears. Krishna appeared more beautiful than a human can conceal. Not only did he appear in this feature, but he glanced over Muchukunda with great affection, attracting the king's mind. Although he was the supreme personality of Godhead, the oldest of all, he looked like a fresh young boy, and his movements were just like those of the free deer. Still he appeared extremely powerful. His influence and vast power are so great that every human being should be afraid of him. When King Muchukunda saw Krishna's magnificent features, he wondered about his identity, and with great humility he asked the Lord, My dear Lord, may I inquire how it is that you happen to be in the cave of this mountain? Who are you? I can see that your feet are just like soft lotus flowers. How could you walk in the forest full of thorns and pebbles? I am simply surprised to see this. Are you not there for the Supreme Personality of Godhead, this most powerful amongst the powerful? Are you not the original source of all illumination and fire? Can I consider? You are one of the great demigods, you one of the great demigods, like the sun god, the moon god, or Indra, king of heaven, or are you the predominating deity of some other planet? Mutsukunda knew well that every higher planetary system has a predominating deity. He was not ignorant like modern men who think that this planet Earth is full of living entities and all others are vacant. This inquiry from Mutsukunda about Krishna's being the predominating deity of a planet unknown to him is a quite appropriate. Because he was a pure devotee of the Lord, King Muchukunda could immediately understand that Lord Krishna, who had appeared before him in such an opulent feature, could not be one of the three dominating deities of the material planets. He must be the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna, who has many Vishnu forms. Mitsukunda therefore took him to be Purusottama, Lord Vishnu. He could see also that the dense darkness within the mountain cave had been dissipated by the Lord's presence. Therefore he could not be other than the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Mitsukunda knew very well that wherever Whenever the Lord is personally present by his transcendental name, qualities, form, and so on, there cannot be any darkness of ignorance. He is like a lamp placed in the darkness. He immediately illuminates a dark place. King Muchukunda was eager to know the identity of Lord Krishna, and therefore he said, O oh, best of human beings, if you think I am fit to know your identity, kindly tell me who you are, what is your parentage, what is your occupation, a duty and what is your family tradition. King Muchukunda thought it wise, however, to identify himself to the Lord first. Otherwise, he had no right to ask the Lord's identity. Etiquette is such that a person of less importance cannot ask the identity of a person of a higher importance. Without first disclosing his own identity, King Muchukunda therefore told Lord Krishna, My dear Lord, let me first inform you of my identity. I belong to the most celebrated dynasty of King Ikswaku. But personally I am not as great as my forefather. My name is Muchukunda. My 
father's name was Mandhata and my grandfather was the great king Yuvanasva. I was very much fatigued due to not resting for many thousands of years and because of this all my bodily limbs were slack and almost incapable of acting. To revive my energy I was taking rest in this solitary cave but I have been awakened by some unknown man who has forced me to wake up although I was not willing to do so. For such an offense act, I have burnt this person to ashes simply by glancing over him. Fortunately, now I can see you in this grand and beautiful feature. I think therefore that you are the cause of my killing, uh, my killing my enemy. My dear Lord, I must admit that due to your bodily effulgence unbearable to my eyes, I cannot see you properly, I can fully. Realize that the influence of your effulgence has diminished my power. I can understand that you are quite fit for being worshipped by all living entities. Seeing this Muchikunda eager to know about his identity, Lord Krishna answered smilingly as follows, My dear King, it is practically impossible to tell about my birth, appearance and disappearance and activities. Perhaps you know that my incarnation Anantadev has unlimited mouths and for an unlimited time he has been trying to narrate fully about my name, fame, qualities, activities, appearance, disappearance and incarnations. But still he has not been, not been able to finish. Therefore it is not possible to know exactly how many names and forms I possess. It may be possible for a material scientist to estimate the number of atomic particles which make up this earthly planet. But the scientist cannot enumerate my unlimited names, forms and activities. Many great sages and saintly persons have tried to list my different forms and activities, yet they have failed to make a complete list. But since you are so eager to know about me, I may inform you that I have now appeared on this planet just to inhalate the demonic principles of the people in general and re-establish the religious principles enjoined in the Vedas. I have been invited for this purpose by Brahma, the superintending deity of this universe, and thus I have now appeared in the dynasty of the Yadus as one of their family members. I have specifically taken my birth as the son of Vasudeva in the Yadu dynasty, and people therefore know me as Vasudeva, the son of Vasudeva. Vasudeva, the son of Vasudeva. You may also know that I have killed Kamsa, who in a previous life was known as Kal Nemi as well as Pralambasura and many other demons. They have acted as my enemies and I have killed them. The demon who was present before you also acted as my enemy and you have very kindly burnt him to ashes by glancing over him. My dear King Mutsukunda, you are my great devotee and I just to show you my causeless mercy, I have appeared in this cave. I am very affectionately inclined toward my devotees and in your previous life before your present condition, you acted as my great devotee and prayed for my causeless mercy. I have therefore come to see you to fulfill your desire. Now you can see me to your heart's content. My dear King, now you may ask from me any benediction and you wish and I am prepared to fulfill your desire. It is my eternal principle that anyone who comes under my shelter must have all his desires fulfilled by my grace. When Lord Krishna ordered King Muchukunda to ask a benediction from him, the king was joyful and he immediately remembered the prediction of Gargamuni who had foretold long before that in the 20th millennium of Vaivastva Manu, Lord Krishna would appear on this planet. As soon as he remembered this prediction, he understood that the Supreme Person Narayan was present before him. As Lord Krishna, he immediately fell down at his lotus feet and began to pray as follows. My dear Lord, O Supreme Personality of Godhead, I can understand that all living entities on this planet are illusioned by your external energy and enamored by the illusory satisfaction of sense gratification. Being fully engaged in illusory activities, they are reluctant to worship your lotus feet and because they are unaware of the benefits of surrendering unto your lotus feet, 
they are subjected to various miserable conditions of material existence. They are foolishly attached to so-called society, friendship and love, which merely produce different kinds of miseries. Illusion, by your external energy, everyone, whether man or woman, is attached to this material existence, and all are engaged in cheating one another in a great society of the cheaters and the cheated. These foolish persons, not knowing how fortunate they are to have obtained this human form of life, are reluctant to worship your lotus feet. By the influence of your external energy, they are attached to the glare of material activities, to so-called society, friendship and love, like dumb animals that have fallen into a dark well. The example of a dark well is given because in the fields there are many wells unused for years and covered over by grass, and poor animals not knowing of them fall into them, and unless rescued they die. Being captivated by a few blades of grass, the animals fall into a dark well and meet death. Similarly, foolish persons without knowing the importance of the human form of life spoil it simply for sense gratification and die without any useful purpose. My dear Lord, I am not an exception to this universal law of material nature. I am also a foolish person who has wasted his time for nothing and my position is especially difficult on account of my being situated in the royal order. I was more puffed up than ordinary persons. An ordinary man thinks he is the proprietor of his body or his family, but I began to think in that way on a larger scale. I wanted to be the master of the whole world, and as I became puffed up with the ideas of sense gratification, my bodily concept of life became stronger and stronger. My attachment for home, wife, and children, for money, and supremacy over the world became more and more acute. In fact, it was limitless, so I remained always attached to thoughts of my material living conditions. Therefore, my dear Lord, I wasted so much of my valuable time with no benefits as my misconception of life I intensified. I began to think of this material body which is just a bag of flesh and bones as the all in all, and in my vanity I believed I had become the king of human society. In this misconception of bodily life, I traveled all over the world, accompanied by my military strength, soldiers, charioteers, elephants and horses. Assisted by many commanders and puffed up by power, I could not trace out your lordship who always sit within my heart as the most intimate friend. I did not care for you, and this was the fault of my so-called exalted material condition. I think that, like me, all living creatures are careless about spiritual realization and are always full of anxieties, thinking, what is to be done, what is next? But because we are strongly bound by material desires, we continue to remain in craziness. Yet in spite of our being so absorbed in material thought, inevitable time, which is only a form of yourself, is always careful about its duty, and as soon as the allotted time is over, your lordship immediately ends all the activities of our material dreams. As the time factor, you end all our activities as a hungry black snake swiftly swallows up a small rat without leniency. Due to the action of cruel time, the royal body which was always decorated with golden ornaments during life and which moved on a chariot drawn by beautiful horses or on the back of an elephant nicely decorated with golden ornaments and which was advertised as the king of human society. That same royal body decomposes under the influence of inevitable time and becomes fit for being eaten by worms and insects or being turned into asses or the stool of an animal. This beautiful body may be recognized as a royal body while in the living condition, but after death the body of even a king is eaten by an animal and therefore turned into stool or is cremated in a crematorium and turned into ashes or is put into an earthly grave where different kinds of worms and insects are produced of it. 
My dear Lord, we come under the full control of this inevitable time, not only after death, but also in a different way. While living, for example, I may be a powerful king, and yet when I came home after conquering the world, I became subjected to many material conditions. When I came back victorious, all subordinate kings may come and offer their respects. But as soon as I entered the inner section of my palace, I myself became an instrument in the hands of the queens, and for sense gratification, I have to fall down at the feet of women. The material way of life is so complicated that before taking the enjoyment of material life, one has to work so hard that there is uh, scarcely an uh, opportunity for peacefully enjoying. And to attain all material facilities, one has to undergo severe austerities and penances and be elevated to the heavenly planets. If one gets the opportunity to take birth in a very rich or royal family, even then he is always anxious to maintain the status quo, uh, status quo and prepare for the next life by performing various sacrifices and distributing a charity. Even in royal life one is full of anxieties, not only because of political administration but also in regard to being elevated to the heavenly planets. It's, it is therefore very difficult to get out of material entanglement, but if one is somehow the other favored by you, by your mercy alone he is given the opportunity to associate with a pure devotee. That is the beginning of liberation from the entanglement of material conditional life. My dear Lord, only by the association of pure devotees is one able to approach your Lordship, who are the controller of both the material and the spiritual existences. You are the supreme goal of all pure devotees, and by association with pure devotees, one can develop his dormant love for you. Therefore, development of Krishna consciousness in the association of pure devotees is the cause of liberation from this material entanglement. My dear Lord, you are so merciful that in spite of my being reluctant to associate with your pure devotees, you have shown your extreme mercy upon me as a result of my slight contact with such a pure devotee as Gargamuni. By your causeless mercy only have I lost all my material appellances, my kingdom and my family. I do not think I could have gotten rid of all these entanglements without your causeless mercy. Kings and emperors sometimes accept the life of an ascetic to forget their royal life, but by your special causeless mercy I have already been bereft of royalty. I do not need to become a mendicant or practice renunciation. My dear Lord, I therefore pray that I may simply be engaged in rendering transcendental loving service unto your lotus feet. This the ambition of pure devotees who are freed from all material contamination. You are the supreme person of Godhead and you can offer me you can offer me anything I want including liberation but who is such a fool that after pleasing you he would ask from you something which might cause entanglement in this material world I do not think any sane man would ask such a benediction from you I therefore surrender unto you because you are the supreme personality of Godhead you are the super soul living in everyone's heart and you are the impersonal Brahman effulgence Moreover, you are also this material world because this material world is only the manifestation of your external energy. Therefore, from any angle of vision, you are the supreme shelter for everyone. Whether on the material plane or on the spiritual plane, everyone must take shelter on the lotus feet. I therefore submit unto you, my Lord, for many, many births I have been suffering from the threefold miseries of this material existence, and I am now tired of it. I have been impelled only by my senses, and I was never satisfied. I therefore take shelter of your lotus feet, which are the source of all peaceful life and which can eradicate all lamentation caused by material contamination. My dear Lord, you are the super soul of everyone, and you can understand everything. Now I am free from all contamination of material desire. I do not wish to enjoy this material world, nor do I wish to 
take advantage of merging into your spiritual effulgence. No do I wish to meditate upon your localized aspect of Paramatma, for I know that simply by taking shelter of you, I shall become completely peaceful and undisturbed. On hearing this statement by King Musikunda, Lord Krishna replied, My dear King, I am very much pleased with your statement you have been the king of all the lands on this planet, but I am surprised to find that your mind is now freed from all con material contamination. You are now fit to execute a devotional service. I am most pleased to see that although I offered you the opportunity to ask from me any kind of benediction, you did not take advantage of us asking for material benefits, I can understand that your mind is now fixed in me and it is not disturbed by any material quality. The material qualities are three, namely goodness, passion and ignorance. When one is placed into these mixed material qualities of passion and ignorance, various kinds of greed and lusty desires impel him or try to find comfort in this material world. When situated in these material qualities of goodness, one tries to purify himself by performing various penances and austerities. When one reaches the platform of a real Brahmana, he aspires to merge into the existence of the Lord. But when one desires only to render service unto the lotus feet of the Lord, he is transcendental to all these three qualities. The pure, the pure Krishna conscious person is therefore always free from all material qualities. My dear King, Lord Krishna continued, I offer to give you any kind of a benediction just to test how much you have advanced in devotional service. Now, I can see that you are on the platform of the pure devotees, for your mind is not disturbed by any greedy or lusty desires of this material world. The yogis who are trying to elevate themselves by controlling their senses and who meditate upon me by practicing the breathing exercises of pranayama are not so thoroughly freed from material desires. It has been seen in several cases that as soon as there is allurement, such yogis again come down to the material platform. The vivid example verifying this statement is Vishwamitra Muni. Vishwamitra Muni was a great yogi who practiced pranayama, a breathing exercise. But when he was visited by Menaka, a society woman of, of the heavenly planets, he lost all control and bigot in her daughter named Sakuntala. But the pure devotee Haridas Thakur was never disturbed even when all such elements were... Uh, offered by a prostitute. My dear King, Lord Krishna continued, I therefore give you the special benediction that you will always think of me. Thus, you will be able to traverse this material world freely without being contaminated by the material qualities. This statement by the Lord confirms that a person in true Krishna consciousness engaged in the transcendental loving service of the Lord under the direction of the spiritual master is never subject to the contamination of material qualities. My dear King, the Lord said, because you are a Kshatriya, you have committed the offense of slaughtering animals both in hunting and in political engagements. To become purified, just engage yourself in the practice of bhakti yoga and always keep your mind absorbed in me. Very soon you will be free from all reactions to such sordid activities. In this statement it appears that although Kshatriyas are allowed to kill animals in hunting, they are not freed from the resultant contamination of sinful reactions. Therefore. Whether one is a Chatriya, Vaishya or Brahmana, one is recommended to take sannyas at the end of life to engage himself completely in the service of the Lord and thus become freed from all sinful reactions of his past life. The Lord, the Lord then assured King Muchukunda, in your next life you will take your birth as a first class Vaishnava, the best of Brahmanas, and in that life your only business will be to engage yourselves in my transcendental service. A 
Vaishnava is a first class Brahmana because one who has not acquired the qualification of a bona fide Brahmana cannot come to the platform of a Vaishnava. When one becomes a Vaishnava, he is completely engaged in welfare activities for all living entities. The highest welfare activity for all living entity is the preaching of Krishna consciousness. It is stated herein that those who are specifically favored by the Lord can become absolutely Krishna conscious and be engaged in the work of preaching the Vaisnava philosophy. Thus ends the Bhaktivedan purport of the 51st chapter of Krishna, the deliverance of Muchukunda. Hare Krishna.